Uh, what do you think? <clears throat> yep. Yep. Let's go on. So, um, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the COVID nineteen uh, five parallel session, which is <laughs> something we wouldn't have expected last year at CCS uh, twenty nineteen, I guess. And uh, uh, so we have five talks uh, planned in this session, and um, you can decide either to give the talk live or to play a video, as you as you know. Uh, I I prefer slight preference for live talks, but it's just up to you. And uh, let's go to the first one, who is uh, Chiara Poletto from uh, uh, INSERM, and she will be talking about diversity in humans and pathogens implications of the dynamics of epidemics and the impact of interventions. Chiara, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for, uh, for the invitation. It's a, it's a huge honor for me to, to present my work here. So yes, uh, given that it is the COVID-19 session, we speak mainly about COVID and what I did recently on the topic. Actually, the title is quite generic, but uh, 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 honestly, the diversity in humans, heterogeneity is related to humans and individuals, uh, uh, cover a male role, I believe, on these, uh, on these first months uh, uh, of the pandemic uh, and were uh, an important focus of uh, the scientific debate. And uh, I, will, uh, I will speak a bit about that and also will argue at the end that instead pathogen heterogeneities uh, will, uh, will be important, uh, especially if we want to understand uh, the coronavirus dynamics in the, in the next years. So, Oops. Okay, so uh, yes, I'm going to show you this curve. This is the, the, the case counting. I think we are all watching this uh, almost every day since the beginning of the epidemic. And, uh, uh, and that's because actually data uh, are the only means for us uh, of understanding uh, the, the, the scale of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, actually data uh, um, do not speak by themselves, they provide very little information and, uh, uh, and we need modeling uh, to make sense of them and in particular complex system modeling. And, and this is true in general, this is true for, uh, for infectious diseases, epidemic, for, uh, for epidemics, but this is even more true for this case, for the case of the coronavirus pandemic, because this was the pandemic of the records and everything was unprecedented. Um, uh, well, on one side, we had the human reaction that it was uh, completely new um, in, uh, in what we, in how we react, but also on the scale of this reaction. Uh, with, I will speak about uh, uh, the lockdown, in particular, the lockdown of one. Uh, we will mention also the, the, the huge uh, drop uh, of, uh, of uh, flights, uh, we, we reach nearly the 100% drop of flights, basically flights were not driving. Uh, and, uh, but on one side we have this, on the other actually, to understand the impact of this, uh, of this uh, unprecedented reaction, uh, well, th this was difficult because of the many unknowns related to the coronavirus. So uh, the coronavirus was, uh, was novel and uh, uh, we try to use uh, uh, pandemic influenza as a reference system for, uh, um, for guiding our response to coronavirus. But this was not a good reference system because coronavirus influenza are very different. And for, with respect, for instance, to, to, to the role of children versus adults, uh, for the role of, of the presymptomatic phase on transmission. And uh, uh, another reason why modeling was so important uh, and why we have uh, uh, five sessions of coronavirus uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this conference is that if on one side we were, we, we were having big questions, on the other we were having also big data. Uh, um, the information on the transmission uh, during this pandemic uh, uh, was uh, uh, unprecedented compared to previous uh, emerging uh, diseases and previous epidemic. Here I'm showing you uh, uh, a, a picture on uh, contact tracing. Uh, contact tracing data represent a paramount uh, example of this. Um, we have uh, large scale information on this related to, to uh, and this, uh, this provides us information on the role of, of individuals 
to us, so individual heterogeneities, but also setting heterogeneities uh, in transmission. Um, and okay, this, this, this consideration we kind of underline my, 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 my presentation, and I want to, to, to present a bit what uh, we did in this first month of the pandemic, uh, starting since the very be beginning, in which uh, how our focus was mainly on the, uh, on the risk of, of a global spread. And uh, actually, uh, uh, we were working on coronavirus uh, during the first two months. At that time, the epidemic was mainly confined in China. And, uh, uh, and we were observing uh, uh, sporadic, uh, um, sporadic cases, imported cases in the other countries. And uh, of course, the question everybody was asking, are we going to have a pandemic? Uh, uh, since the beginning, we, we, we analyzed the risk of importation in several countries. The countries I work uh, on that uh, in collaboration with the uh, colleagues at Intisam, in particular Vittoria Colizza. We provide projection on the risk of importation for Europe. And uh, uh, actually, by the time in which uh, our report was published, the uh, uh, two among the top three countries with the, uh, the predi highest uh, predictive risk uh, started to report cases. Our projections were in agreement with uh, other studies. Um, uh, um, besides Europe, we also focus on, on Africa. Uh, Africa is a, a peculiar setting because of uh, um, uh, everybody was concerned about uh, this, this continent because, the, because many countries are not uh, prepared to, to, to face uh, a pandemic emergency. Um, uh, here, we decided to contrast the risk of introduction as measured by air traffic with uh, an index that measure preparedness. And this is a, a self-evaluation uh, uh, index within in the context of a WHO framework. So we could identify those countries that has a low uh, preparedness, a low capacity to face an outbreak, and at the same time, in high risk of, of introduction. But these, these studies were done at the very beginning in which, uh, in which, okay, the spatial propagation were kind of simple in the sense that the containment measure in China didn't, uh, uh, didn't have effect yet, uh, were not at, uh, in place yet. Um, then uh, China uh, 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 decided to put Wuhan in lockdown. Uh, this intervention was unprecedented. They want to understand it, the, its impact on the global propagation. Uh, just to provide a, 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 some a, a term of comparison, we worked on on travel restriction uh, and the international spread and the, the impact of travel restriction on the international spread um, uh, uh, in the past, uh, quite extensively in the past. In particular, we studied. Uh, uh, the Western Africa of 2014, and uh, um, and these uh, in this case, uh, due to the concern for the epidemic, uh, a lot of, of companies cut the flight with, us, with Western Africa, and this produced what we thought it was a huge drop in the international connection between Africa and the rest of the world, a 60% drop. And so we use uh, modeling, we use GLIM. Uh, the GLIMS is for a global epidemic mobility model uh, uh, to simulate uh, the global propagation and compare a situation in which traffic was kind of regular uh, uh, with a, a traffic as the year before with a traffic that was reduced. And we found that this huge drop uh, was uh, producing a very limited uh, delay. We, 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 we quantified the fact uh, uh, in the epidemic propagation in terms of the delay in propagation. And this drop was producing only a few weeks of delay. And this can be understood because we can show mathematically that is the, just the algorithmic relationship between the reduction in the traffic and uh, uh, the delay in propagation. Uh, therefore, you can conclude that the delay in general is limited, but Actually, for the, um, the case of one, the reduction was 100%. So really, they managed to block the city. And this was something that could be uh, unconceivable before. Uh, still, the, the epidemic was able to, 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 to get out. 
And that's the, there is this nice uh, infographics the, uh, of uh, New York Times uh, explaining all the steps that uh, made, made it possible. Actually, we were we were following closely this uh, this uh, this event, uh, and uh, uh, we decided to to look into the data to better understand uh, uh, how importations uh, uh, evolve in time. We collected uh, um, uh, all available information related to the first uh, almost 300 cases reported by WHO out of China. Uh, this was an extensive. Uh, um, uh, search so we search uh, for uh, into the news uh, the the public report and we reconstruct the history of importation for all cases this is summarized here for all traveling cases and we can see the date of onset the date of hospitalization the date of traveling etc for all the cases in, for which we we found the information and this allows us to understand uh, some aspect related to the importation and the local transmission following importation and in particular uh, um, we try to reconstruct the dynamics of importation so um, here in red i'm showing uh, the curve of importation as they were reported um, and but for some cases we had also so the data of traveling, the travel, traveling out from, uh, from Wuhan. And so we use uh, Bayesian maximum likelihood analysis to estimate, uh, to reconstruct the date of traveling. So the curve of importation by date of traveling for all cases. And what we found is the blue curve. And we can see that uh, we estimated a, a, a rapid, a sudden drop uh, starting from the date in which uh, um, the, the travel ban in Wuhan was implemented. Uh, so we found that basically importation were rapidly growing with a, a, a doubling time of, of three days, so it was very rapid exponential growth. But actually, this was stopped completely from the the, the cordoning of one, and uh, um, and actually uh, importation were almost zero, but not only from one, also from the rest of China. Uh, so we con concluded that. The cordoning of one had an unprecedented effect, but actually, if we look into, more closely into the data, we realized that this was too late. Uh, uh, that's because if uh, looking at uh, all the importation and transmission event we collected, we realized that some transmission out from China uh, were happening without any, any known index case. So the traveling the traveling index case that caused transmission uh, in foreign countries were not recorded in many cases. So uh, we realized then that there was some underreporting, and we use again some Bayesian inference to, to, to quantify uh, uh, this, this underreporting. We estimated that 64% of cases went unseen. Uh, uh, this result is in agreement also with different genetic studies, in particular uh, the study of uh, uh, led by uh, the, the MLAB, in which they found that a large proportion of importation event went, uh, uh, were, were contained, were handled, were, were detected, but actually few importation event uh, uh, managed to escape um, um, the, 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 the public health authorities and generated the outbreak and the pandemic out, out of China. So, uh, to conclude, um, the, uh, the cordoning of one had an unprecedented effect, it was strong, it, it got close to contain the outbreak at the source. Um, this brings me to the second part uh, of, my, of, my, of my talk. Uh, actually, the reason why uh, uh, um, foreign countries didn't manage to contain cases, it's because it was done later uh, well understood and quantified by contact by contact tracing studies is that um, there is a central role of asymptomatic and presymptomatic transmission uh, 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 in this coronavirus epidemic. Uh, uh, there is a modeling study that estimated that uh, that uh, uh, under this condition, given the high transmissibility, the importance of presymptomatic transmission, contact tracing would have been uh, very costly and likely ineffective. So costly in terms of rapidity, we need to be rapid and to trace a lot of contact. Otherwise, we won't be able to, 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 to identify all of them. 
So this is clearly not feasible uh, uh, for a manual contact tracing. This is why uh, a, a debate raised on digital solution to uh, boost, to, to enhance contact tracing in terms of rapidity and scale. So this uh, debate uh, uh, around uh, uh, digital contact tracing was a particular important, particularly strong during the, the lockdown, during the spring, last spring, because uh, uh, of the needs of, uh, of designing um, um, sustainable strategies able to contain the outbreak uh, without uh, a lockdown. Uh, so there are uh, clearly digital, this is another, another, another important aspect, another record, uh, if you want, of, uh, of this coronavirus epidemic. So digital contact tracing is a completely new measure. So we don't have any, any, any past experience to judge uh, its effect. This is how, why modeling also in this case is needed to provide projection on the impact of this measure. Many groups uh, were uh, provided models to, to, to understand it. And, uh, um, but this model must account to the fact that uh, actually app adoption is expected to be not so high. Actually, it was extremely low at the beginning, but now it's rising in many countries, in particular in Italy, it's already almost 20% in France, uh, because of the, 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 the rise of the second wave of the epidemic. However, still this, uh, this adoption is low because uh, um, uh, uh, it was found in particular by, by study of black collaborators uh, that uh, uh, the effect of adoption, the effect of the app is quadratic in the, in the adoption. So we work on this, but actually our focus was mainly on the, on the role of age into this picture and on the role of age heterogeneities on the impact of, of, of the app. Indeed, uh, um, one, one source of concern, it was since the beginning, the fact that uh, smartphone penetration is uh, extremely heterogeneous by age. In particular, um, uh, uh, a small proportion of elderly uh, own a smartphone, and elderly are the most vulnerable to the to, to coronavirus infection. Um, and so we wanted to, to understand the impact of this, but in order to, to study it, we need to, to account for uh, age heterogeneities uh, on, on other aspects related to coronavirus transmission. In particular, we need to, to remember that the contact behavior is highly heterogeneous by age. So here on the uh, bottom right, I'm showing the age contact pattern as collected by polymod studies. These studies represent the reference for contact behavior um, uh, relevant for transmission. And so um, normally uh, elderly have lower contact than young, the younger population. Another important aspect that is peculiar to coronavirus is, as I was mentioning in the beginning, the, 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 the relative role of children versus adults in transmission. So it was evident since the beginning that children were not covering such a, a, a central role in transmission as we normally observe for influenza and other respiratory infection. And actually, uh, later on, it was estimated that this was due, due to uh, a reduced susceptibility and a reduced rate of clinical symptoms in children compared to adults. So the coronavirus epidemic appeared to be mainly driven by adults. Um, so we tried to, to, to study the interplay between these three factors. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, we need clearly a model able to encompass uh, all these heterogeneous features and also the heterogeneous role of transmission settings. So we design a, a model that, that, that is, uh, uh, let's say, rooted on an agent-based modeling. So we collect uh, uh, census statistics on age, household composition, school, workplace. But actually, it's uh, quite uh, uh, unrealistic to assume that all people enter in contact with everybody in the same workplace every day. And for contact tracing, uh, this assumption would be quite, uh, quite uh, a bad assumption to proper modeling it. So we try to extract a subnetwork uh, to model a subnetwork that really uh, account, uh, really model human to human interaction. And to do that, we cross all the information available, in particular the information on contact survey that, that was uh, uh, including proportion of contacts across settings and proportion of contacts in terms also of the frequency. 
So we could uh, design a model uh, based on, uh, by crossing all this information, a human-to-human -human contact network that is dynamic, also varying in time with heterogeneous frequency across the individuals and contacts, and also multi-layer, because uh, each layer represents contacts across uh, different settings. So we could account for household, workplace, school, community, and transport. And this vision, this, uh, this idea of modeling uh, contacts with a multi-layer uh, is quite uh, it's it's uh, it's quite convenient also because for its clarity and it is becoming recently uh, uh, adopted by 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 uh, several studies, uh, in particular the nice work of you of you and collaborators. So we use this model uh, um, to um, this framework to model how our coronavirus epidemic and the impact of interventions with design a compartmental model. Uh, minimal but still realistic for coronavirus and we design uh, a model for the intervention and here the focus how our goal was to be as much realistic as possible uh, possibly not too much optimistic we assume a detection rate that was not 100%. We, we hypothesized a 50% of that 50 of clinical cases were detected and if they own the app can trigger the alert. So what we found is a quantification of the impact of the measure. So we found that the measure was not able to stop under this condition, the, 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 the epidemic propagation. And that we, 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 we thought about a second wave scenario, how our goal was that the, the study was done last spring with the idea of modeling a second wave like in France. And so we assume some immunity in the population. And we found that the, under the hypothesis of a high transmissibility, we would have a substantial reduction in the incidence and uh, attack rate. If we study, we think about a scenario with low transmissibility that actually posteriorly, this, the second one was more realistic because uh, likely, we f likely we found that transmissibility was not so high during, during uh, um, the pre-second uh, lockdown, let's say, period. And in this case, the reduction could have been sufficient to uh, maintain the epidemic under uh, hospital saturation level if the app would have been adopted by more than 30% of the population. This didn't happen and we are in the lockdown now, unfortunately. Uh, I think that one, one result, very interesting result we found is that we quantified the reduction uh, um, uh, in transmission due to the effect of the app uh, by age. And we found actually that the highest reduction was uh, in, uh, in the elderly population, despite the lowest adoption is in the elderly population. And that's because uh, actually uh, the, the peripheral uh, position of elderly in a transmission network and the fact that uh, this measure really target uh, the, the young adults that are the ones that are the most important for driving the, 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 the coronavirus epidemic. So um, to conclude on this topic, um, uh, some studies are popping out now that uh, quantify uh, uh, the effect of the app in the real world. This is challenging because uh, uh, for privacy reason, uh, uh, very few data are collected uh, uh, from users. So we have very little information of the of, the, of who adopted the, the, uh, the app and if he got infected. And, uh, but still some, day, some, some, some a couple of works are showing that this, uh, this intervention is effective. Uh, given the little information, fortunately we will take time to real, really quantify the impact of, of this app and modeling still represents an important uh, uh, tool to, to provide projection. So I want to conclude my presentation by, by quickly mentioning uh, some perspective for the future of the coronavirus epidemic. Um, actually, well, what's next? This is a question that uh, um, many, many, many uh, publications already have, have addressed, uh, try to understand the long-term dynamics of, of coronavirus. 
Uh, this is a very challenging question. Uh, um, Kisla and collaborators projected, uh, say that uh, an endemic circulation may be possible depending on the interaction with other coronavirus uh, uh, previously circulating, but actually the study of Southern Roy was more cautious saying, uh, well, it all depends also on waning immunity and the effect of vaccination. Uh, still, what is clear is that in the long term now, the virus is very powerful because the world population is susceptible to it. In the long term, instead, it, it, the competition with other respiratory infection or other coronavirus strain would become increasingly relevant. Um, not only for understanding the, the, the circulation of coronavirus, but also the circulation of respiratory infection in general. Here I'm showing on the bottom, on the left, uh, bottom, uh, um, the prevalence of other respiratory infection in UK, and it's interesting to see that only rhinovirus is circulating. Um, so we need to, to shift, to drift toward a more ecological perspective, and, uh, and instead of uh, focusing on coronavirus alone, we need to, um, to see him, uh, his interaction with, the, look at its interaction with other pathogens. And uh, um, and actually, this is an interesting topic, very, very well studied in the literature, but uh, um, uh, if uh, a central point on it is the fact that uh, the interaction between multiple uh, pathogens or strain actually depends, uh, critically depends on the spreading substrate, so the human-to-human -human network. Uh, the literature in the field of complex network epidemic spreading dealing with the interacting pathogen, I, I believe it's still, uh, it's still uh, at the beginning. There is a, a lot to do in this direction. And it's interesting because this is uh, uh, important uh, in the sense that uh, the, the, the characteristic of the population, the spreading substrate may, may completely alter uh, how a prediction related to the coexistence or the dominance of multiple pathogens. And to provide an example of this, I would like to mention just with one slide a work we did recently. And uh, um, uh, actually, uh, many works uh, studied uh, um, the, the cooperation between, uh, uh, between pa dif different pathogens, or other studies studied the competition between pathogens. But actually, uh, uh, the two forces were uh, rarely studied uh, together. And actually, and why instead they they uh, they they let's say uh, they act together simultaneously. Just to show some example, uh, there is a strong interest in studying the competition between tuberculosis uh, uh, strain, or uh, uh, there is interest in studying the, the cooperation between tuberculosis and HIV. But actually, the the the, the thing, these things are not in isolation, but that they are together. And uh, the same example, another a, a similar example is for pneumococcus and flu. Uh, we decided to, to, to study this, uh, this dynamical system. And so the, the, the presence of two, uh, one pathogen structured in two strains that compete one with the other, and uh, in presence of a cooperating pathogen, a pathogen that cooperates with the, with, with the two. Uh, and uh, we found a very rich and complex behavior in this situation. And what was more interesting is the fact that uh, not only, so, so the key parameters here are the, the, the how once, how each strain is able to take advantage of the cooperation. Uh, another current parameter is how each strain is transmissible. So there is the interplay between these two, two aspects. And, uh, um, and what we found, not only the phase diagram is quite complex, but also uh, this, this is completely altered by the underlying network. A and if we consider a community, a network of the community, we found the coexistence between the two competing strain. So coexistence is not possible in presence of the cooperating pathogen alone. It's not possible in presence of community without the cooperating pathogen, but community plus cooperating pathogen enable coexistence. And this is showing how 
how it's important to consider heterogeneities at the host level together with heterogeneity at pathogen level. And hopefully, all the information that is becoming available, uh, uh, that was mentioned in the very quick beginning related to contact tracing uh, studies, uh, uh, information on individual heterogeneities in transmission is going to shed light also on uh, important mechanism in, in disease ecology. So I have concluded with this my presentation. I would like to thank uh, my, all the people involved in the works uh, I presented. In particular, let me thank the young, uh, the young researcher uh, of my group, uh, Jesus Moreno Lopez, Francesco Pinotti, Beatriz Arrigo Garcia, and Piotr Bekowski that did the majority of the work here. I would like also to thank my senior collaborator, in particular, Vittoria Colizza Pieri Boal at Inserm, Halabara, with whom, whom I collaborated for the contact tracing uh, um, uh, paper, and uh, uh, Philip Owell and Fakta Gabarjan, with whom I collaborated for, uh, for the multi strain project I mentioned at the end. So thank you all for, uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Chiara. It was a very nice talk indeed, and presented several interesting aspects that will for sure keep us busy in the next few years, like this idea of cooperating diseases in order to actually control one of them is, is actually a quite interesting line of research. Any um, question from the field? Uh, if you do have a question, just, uh, just open your microphone and ask, because I can't see all of you. So, uh, wait. Oh, in terms of the, uh, I, I had a certain, just a curiosity, it's not just, it's not exactly a question. Uh, in terms of the speed of, uh, of um, importation, this is the first part of the talk that we're talking about, uh, the, the, the probability of importing a case. Um, was, was it really um, um, aligned with your predictions? I mean, is it true that Take into account just the or mostly the transportation, the island transportation network uh, is already enough to predict uh, this importation probability with high accuracy. So, in, in terms of speed, uh, we didn't uh, we didn't uh, uh, check that actually. So we did uh, we didn't uh, um, this time we didn't go for a mechanistic modeling of the propagation. We did it for every pandemic before. Maybe this time we were bored. But actually, uh, no, no, I'm kidding. Actually, no. The, the serious point is that. Uh, um, uh, Based on the experience, we know that uh, uh, that uh, uh, actually our transportation is very good predictor of the pattern of propagation. So um, uh, this is based on the experience of previous epidemics in which we, we, we find a strong correlation between our traffic and uh, um, and the, the actual pattern of propagation. There are many studies we did or other groups did uh, like Dirk Brockman, like Vespignani, mm -hmm. and, but there is also theoretical foundation behind that uh, related to the fact that there are sort of, uh, um, uh, let's say heterogeneities in the contact network uh, enhance the predictability of the outbreak. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what we observed, um, uh, um, what we served at the beginning is uh, was really aligned with the, how our knowledge on the global propagation of epidemics, and indeed it was behaving quite well. The, let's see, quite well in the sense, quite uh, according yeah. to the, the expectation before yeah. the ban. Yeah. Thank you. There is another um, question uh, by Giovanni Pedri, and says you would like to uh, you to say a bit more about the cooperation competition paper. I'm curious about how the model is written down, he writes. Um, maybe you can provide a... Uh, I can try to, to quickly, so here we have, uh, um, so we try to do to be simple. So we have uh, an SIS kind of dynamics. 
And uh, so all, all three pathogens follow an SIS dynamics. We have uh, uh, cooperation in the sense that uh, acquire pathogen A enhance the, 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 the risk of acquiring the pathogen B1 uh, or B2. There is mutual exclusion between B1 and B2, mutual, otherwise it uh, become, becomes too complex. That's already quite a complex dynamics. Uh, so what we are, are, are hypothesizing is uh, uh, different transmission traits different uh, pathogen traits in the sense that B1 and B2 uh, are different in terms of cooperation with IA and in terms of transmissibility. But we consider very little differences. So, so two strains uh, normally are different in terms of pathogen traits, but we cannot uh, realistically imagine a, a strong difference. And indeed, we found an interesting phase diagram uh, in this, uh, even at uh, not huge differences. Mm -hmm. Well, cooperation may be a bit, yes, but uh, transmissibility, no. Great, very good. Thank you, Dan. And uh, if there are no other questions, we'll uh, give a virtual round of applause to uh, Chiara. And uh, thanks again for your, for your great talk. And let's uh, uh, go now to the contributed oral talk. And the next one, the first one is Riccardo Gallotti, uh, who is ready, I believe. Aren't Thank you? you so much. Thank you. Yes, and Ricardo will talk about assessing the risks of infodemics in response to the COVID-19 epidemics. Ricardo, over to you. Thank you. So to my audience, I want to ask you, where were you the 22nd of January of this year? Because it was a very peculiar moment for us. For me, it was, uh, I was in Japan. I had the luck of being in an SIX 2020. I was presenting another, another work. And uh, while I was in Japan, my collaborator, Manlio de Domenico, uh, wrote me and said, yeah, there is this virus circulating in Asia. It's better if, if you and Oriol, who was a colleague uh, traveling with me, take care and travel uh, uh, safely. And uh, uh, this is why I show you a, a, a photo of me wearing a mask before it was cool. But at the same time, uh, I am uh, Malia started also gathering all tweets uh, that they could uh, concerning coronavirus, COVID, all the names that the virus took uh, in time, and also formed a team. And with this team of five people, we work our ass out during the first months of the pandemic, as much as the people working in epidemics, I believe. Because uh, the idea that Malia had was uh, let's try to track in real time the spread of the infodemic on Twitter. And at the time, I have no clue of what an infodemic was, actually. If infodemic is uh, something that happens where there is too much information circulating, and there is some information which is reliable, some which, which isn't, and you can't really distinguish uh, easily what is the reliable information that you are um, facing. This is a graph that we made to explain this kind of, uh, this kind of co uh, conflict between information because there are actors that spread fake news and actors who spread reliable news and some passive actor in the middle that are just in doubt of what is the, the real information we're circulating. And this was actually happening to everybody of us in the first months of the pandemic. And uh, the data gathered were huge. Uh, we gathered uh, in the, the last time we checked, it was 1 billion tweets gathered worldwide. Of those, uh, uh, more than 150 million had the URL classic that we could classify as reliable and unreliable or unknown. And uh, more or less half of the tweets gathered, we managed to jet code and, and associate it to a specific country. So we, we created a, a very like a complex pipeline of, of which in, uh, for what I was discussing in this paper, the three point matter is the fact that we decoded the tweets in space. We fact checked them crossing the URLs with a list of uh, um, a list of URLs classified by other people in, in websites or in other papers that can allow us to assess if the news were reliable or not. For us, for us our news is not reliable when you should be careful if the, the source sometimes share not reliable information and you should at least take it with a grain of salt. And uh, well, thanks of this information, we could make some risk analysis about the infodemics. That is what I'm discussing here. But uh, uh, the, our first focus was trying to build an interactive platform so that we could share the information we were gathering in real time. And the platform went online the 10th of March. 
And at the uh, last time we checked uh, 64,000 uh, unique visitors. And now at the moment is uh, currently supported by WHO, who is paying us to build, uh, to build a new version and a better version. And in this platform that you can assess in this moment, you can uh, observe two quantities that is what we are discussed more in deep in this talk. That is the epidemic, um, and then the, num the epidemic number, so the, the number of people who are uh, contracted the, the virus in time in a country and the infodemic risk index. How we compute this, oh yeah, this is a new, a new slide. Just a, uh, we realized that we got a lot of traction in on the press with this uh, this platform and this is the list of what we um, or the where we went until we stopped uh, taking notes because it was too long so how we estimate the infodemic risk uh, the infodemic risk for us is a matter of exposure so how much exposure uh, someone uh, has of reliable news against unreliable news in particular the risk is how much unreliable news is the fraction of the total of the information you get uh, exposed to. For us, a proxy of exposure is the total number of followers of the, of the people who are com communicating on Twitter. So if you get the total number of followers of the people who are writing messages are, uh, concerning COVID, which are unreliable, and on the other hand, the total number of followers that are, um, of the people who are communicating on Twitter, reliable news, these are the two fraction of exposure that we com you can compare and we create a fraction with. In this paper, we focus on the period between the 22nd of January and the 10th of March 2020. And we can track daily the uh, infodemic risk index we, we compute as this fraction. And uh, on the bottom left, you can see how for Italy, we see a clear drop in the infodemic risk from a number that was in average 0.25 to a very smaller number exactly in conjunction when, with when the, the actual epidemic starts in Italy. Something very similar can be observed on the right, where there is a drop that is not that uh, striking, but what we see is the change of the sources information when the, for the, the epidemic started to grow, the fraction of un unverified users sharing un unreliable information uh, was uh, become more relevant. And uh, with, the, with this information, we could uh, make a map. Actually, uh, we could make a map also in time. And this is a new, a new GIF I prepared showing you the evolution of the infodemic risk index aggregated by country in the last month. And what you can see is there are some countries that are clearly um, more at risk, for instance, Peru, Venezuela, Iran, or Russia. But you can also see how Brazil initially were at low risk and then progressively grew at high risk, probably for political reasons. So we can study the infodemic in time. We can also zoom uh, with using the georeference tweet, the 0.8% of tweets with, which has uh, uh, exact location shared and make maps uh, at higher resolution of the infodemic risk index. For instance, on the top left for Italy, where we see a peak in, in Liguria, in, uh, for Europe or for the US on the bottom. And uh, in, uh, we also observe some patterns that are different from what we observe with, the, with Italy and in the, in, in the US, for instance. Uh, we have Canada, which has the very low infodemic risk, mostly driven by unverified users and a kind of steady, uh, steady value. When on the bottom right, you have South Korea, where the uh, infodemic risk is also kind of low, but is as very spike is very volatile. And uh, if we have on the top right, Russia, where the, the risk is high and very volatile, and uh, Venezuela, where the risk is very high, dominated also by, by, by a large fraction of, of verified um, um, users, and uh, is not that volatile, it's constantly a bad situation. And uh, we, uh, we can end this talk with the good news because uh, gathering all this information and see how the evolution in time was in average for the countries, we see that when the epidemic hits, uh, in, uh, of, often the infodemic level dropped. We can see this uh, on the three different perspectives. On the top left, we gather all the days of all the countries we analyze when there is some epi uh, epidemic value. And we see that uh, uh, aggregating this in, uh, in beans and making a box plot, there is a drop of the cumulative uh, infodemic risk index as the cumulative reported cases grow. So for if, if you have high reported cases, you have lower in risk index. 
On the bottom left, you see the same, uh, same similar pattern as an anti-correlation between the average number of confirmed cases in a country and the, and the average infodemic risk index. And on the right, you see the similar pattern of uh, decreasing infodemic risk index uh, as uh, the epidemic uh, expands, averaged all over the world. So thank you very much for the attention. Our paper had the, the luck of give, being published on Nature and Behavior. It has been a very hard task to uh, confess. And uh, the, the website is available at covid19ops.fbk.au. And we will soon releasing a new awesome version that we are working on. And uh, the last information is another good, good news because all data we, uh, we have worked on is currently available. We have a repository where you can find all the aggregated time series and all the um, tweets ID we have uh, associated to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to read uh, write uh, for yourself. And uh, we, I spent a lot of time work, uh, looking at this kind of data and all this our group is very open for collaborations if you want. Thank you very much. Thanks. Very nice talk indeed. Very nice paper. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Okay. Looks like nobody's uh, opening the microphone. Okay, great. So unless there are, if there are no questions, then uh, we can uh, thank Ricard again. Hello. And uh, thank you very much for your talk. And uh, let's go to the next one, uh, who is uh, Maria Castaldo. Uh, is Maria yes. here? Yes. yes. Very good. Can you please Thanks. share your screen? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank um, you. And Maria, she, Maria is going to talk about the rhythms and of the night, increasing online night activity and emotional resilience during the COVID-19 lockdown. Yes. Over to you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to this talk on the effects of COVID-19 lockdown on the online activity. My name is Maria Castaldo, I am a PhD student at CNRS in France and the work I'm going to present has been done in collaboration with Floriano Gargiulo, Tommaso Venturini and Paolo Frasca. Lockdowns established all around the world during the spring of 2020 created a sudden and severe transformation of daily routines. In many countries, people stopped working or started working from home, kids stopped going to school, bar and restaurants were closed, and the majority of social activity was forbidden. That is why lockdown definitely constitutes one of the most widespread and deepest shock experienced by society in recent years. At the same time, they also constitute a perfect example to investigate which characteristics of online human behavior depend from exogenous events, and which ones instead are resilient to external shocks. In our work, we address these questions focusing on some specific aspects. In the first part of the work, we investigate what did change in online behavior during the lockdown. In particular, we analyzed how the time spent online changed and how both teams and emotions shared on platforms were affected. In the second part of the work, we examined the resilience of certain platform characteristics to external shocks, focusing in particular on how different content is shared and consumed online among different hours of the day. To address these questions, we focused on a particular country, which was France. It is relevant in the rest of the presentation to keep in mind some key dates during the spring of 2020. The lockdown was announced by President Macron on the 15th of March, with effect two days after the 17th of March. It lasted almost two months until the 11th of May. In order to have robust results and to better understand which user behaviors are platform specific, we compare the two platforms, YouTube and Twitter. The YouTube dataset collects the hour by hour evolution of the number of views of almost 100,000 videos. The tracked videos are all the ones published after the 17th of February by a selected list of a thousand French YouTube channels dealing with politics and news disclosure. It's important to stress the relevance of such a YouTube dataset as it cannot be directly obtained from the YouTube API, which is the Google tool that allows researchers and developers to download data from YouTube. In fact, 
can only query the YouTube API to get contemporary statistics of a certain video, as it only returns the number of views at the time the query is performed. In collaboration with the Qatar Computing Research Institute, we started querying the API every hour from the 17th of February, and we were therefore able to reconstruct the history of views trends on our video corpus. Collecting such a fine granularity allowed us to understand the rhythms of content consumption and when a certain type of content is preferred to another one. To perform a cross-platform analysis, we compared the YouTube data with a Twitter corpus of around 8 million tweets and retweets. We selected all the tweets published between February and April by a list of around 5,000 non-professional French users that is, users that had the location set to France in their profile and whose profile description wasn't mentioning any keywords related to official media like televisions or newspapers. A first major habit change we observed is an increase in the online activity. Here is outline the time evolution of different metrics. On top, we can see the evolution of the total number of views in our YouTube dataset. In the middle plot, we can see the evolution of the number of new videos posted on YouTube, while in the bottom plot, we see the number of tweets and retweets a long time. In all the three plots, the dashed line represents the hourly trends, while the solid lines constitute daily averages. As we can see, starting from the 15th of March, which is shown by the green vertical line, the average daily signals reveal an increase of activity for Twitter posting and YouTube watching. It's interesting to notice that on both platforms, the increase of activity started from the very moment the lockdown was announced. The video posting activity, on the other hand, conserved the same weekly and daily rhythm with the beginning of the lockdown and proved to be a more stable activity than tweeting or watching videos on YouTube. Therefore, we could summarize the results so far obtained on YouTube by saying that even though we observed an increase in the demand of content, the offer of new published video remained stable. Once the general increase of online activity is observed, we can better understand how such activity is distributed among different hours of the day. The left plots in the slide show the average distribution of total views among the different hours, both for Twitter and YouTube. The dashed line represents the behavior before the lockdown, while the solid line represents the situation during the lockdown. We first observe that the profiles for Twitter and YouTube are quite different. While Twitter is mostly used during the day, with a strong activity decrease after midnight, YouTube is characterized by a higher night activity. To better visualize the difference between profiles before and during the lockdown, we calculated the relative differences of the normalized profiles, and they're shown in the right part of the slide. Both YouTube and Twitter experienced an activity increase during the night and a decrease of the activity in the early morning. We observed that the morning decreases in Twitter are smaller than the night increase. This suggests that with the lockdown, people stayed longer awake during the night, but without oversleeping in the morning. To confirm the hypothesis of reduced sleep during the lockdown, we analyzed the situation at the individual level on Twitter. For each Twitter user, we calculated the average time lag between two consecutive tweets. The first plot shows the average interval times at each hour of the day. The top line refers to the observation before the lockdown, while the bottom one refers to the lockdown period. While in normal times, the average intervent time are much higher during the night, the lockdown flattens the curve, suggesting a shortening of sleep intervals. In the second plot, we display for each hour of the night the probability that a subsequent tweet is posted the following morning, between 7 and 12 a.m rather than during the night itself. This quantity represents the probability to go to sleep after an event happening at a certain time during the night. We can see that until 4 a.m. the probability to get asleep during the lockdown is lower. 
once a shift in online activity is observed, it becomes interesting to understand whether it corresponds to a shift in terms of content. We focused on changes of content, both from an emotional and a thematic point of view. To analyze the content, we performed some text analysis, considering the titles and descriptions of YouTube videos and the text of tweets and retweets. To analyze the text, we use a tool known as the LIWC dictionary. Using the dictionary, we labeled each word with some labels belonging to three different categories general emotion, specific emotion, and themes. So, in our example, the word lonely can be labeled as a negative, sad word related to social life. Moving on to text classification, we associated each word in the text with a label. Then, for each category of our dictionary, the text was associated with the label expressed by the majority of the words. So, for example, if a text contains two words related to positive emotions and no negative word, the text was going to be attributed to the positive label in the category general emotion. At the same time, if it contains, as in our example, two words related to houses, like home and garden, one word related to biology and one word associated to religion, the text is going to be classified as a text speaking about houses. Comparing the two platforms, we first observe that YouTube is more emotional than Twitter and is generally populated by more positive content. Both platforms experience a decrease of the emotional sphere during the lockdown. But on YouTube in particular, we observe an increase of emotionally negative contents. Regarding specific emotions, we notice that expressions of accomplishment declined in both platforms. Instead, while Twitter experienced a decrease of all the specific emotions, YouTube, which was already characterized by a higher level of anger, sadness, and anxiety, goes through an important increase of those sentiments. From a thematic point of view, we observe, without surprise, a decrease of the contents related to social life and leisure, and an increase of contents related to death and house. On Twitter, we also have a significant increase of religion-related content. All the differences in emotional and thematic content have been tested with Kolmogorov's Mirnov test and have proved to be significant. Once we observed an emotional shift in both platforms, we investigated in what way it was related to circadian rhythms. We divided the, da the day into five time periods and analyzed the distribution of emotional content across different moments of the day, as it is shown by the plots. The important finding that emerges from this analysis is that the daily emotional patterns seems to be resilient to, to the COVID-19 disruption. In fact, the parallelism of the lines before and during the lockdown suggests that even if the volume of some emotion changed during the lockdown, their daily distribution generally maintained the same shape. To conclude, let me stress once again that certain characteristics of online behavior prove to be more affected by lockdowns than others. Circadian rhythm, for example, proved to be strongly related to lifestyle and working hours. At the same time, topic and emotion showed a strong link to the external situation as they shift the lockdown. On the other hand, we pointed out the resilience of emotional hourly patterns. Even if the circadian rhythms changed and people stayed away longer, at night, users continue to share and consume the same emotional type of content. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Maria. Thanks. And is there any question from the audience? Just open your mic or write in the chat, please. And it's quite quite interesting to see how the distribution remained parallel throughout the lockdown. So I mean, they even if you have a shift in the level uh, of of sentiment, then you actually have a pretty much uh, unchanged. Yeah, it was it was quite a surprise. Yes. 
indeed. Okay, cool. Uh, so if there is no other question from the audience, let's uh, thank Marie again. Thank, thank you very much. much. for your talk. Uh, and uh, let's go to the next speaker, who is Alessandro Fuchino. Ready? You are muted. Alessandro, you are muted. Sorry. Hello, Sorry. Enzo. Uh, hello to everybody. Nice to meet you. Okay, I can share my screen. Yes. I have a, a pre-recorded uh, presentation that's, that's fine. That's fine. To, stay, to stay in the time. Yeah, okay. Fine. Okay. Let me share the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, definitely. Okay. okay. Good evening to everybody. In this talk, I will present a new study about the epidemic risk assessment applied as a case study to the COVID-19 outbreak in Italy. Uh, this is a, an interdisciplinary study made in collaboration with many colleagues from University of Catania, Alessia Emanuele Biondo, Nadia Giuffrida, Giuseppe Inturri, Vito Latora, Rosario Lemoli, Andrea Rapisarda, Giovanni Russo and Chiara Zappala. It is well known that COVID outbreak now reached 65 million of cases around the world with about a million and a half deaths. But the spatial distribution of damages is far from homogeneous. This is true over different spatial scales. For example, looking to the epidemic diffusion in Europe, it is clear that different regions in different countries have been affected in a very different way by the virus. In this study, we will focus on the epidemic diffusion in Italy, where it is evident that impact is quite different going from northern regions towards southern ones. One could speak of three different Italies. As you can see at the end of the first epidemic wave in July 2020, more than 80% of cases and deaths were concentrated in the, in the eight northern regions in red, while only less than 20% in the other 12 regions of center and south. Also, intensive care occupancy close to the epidemic peak in April was mostly concentrated in the north. The tails of this data for the various Italian regions can be appreciated in these color maps for total cases, deaths, and the intensive care occupants. Looking at the change in the percentage of deaths in 2020 with respect to the average of the previous five years during the first epidemic wave, one can notice again a noticeable increment only in the northern part of the country. This unequal distribution of COVID effects in Italy is even stranger as several recent studies showed that the virus was already circulating since September 2019. Therefore, it had had enough time to spread over the whole Italian territory well before the mobility restrictions that in Italy were applied only at the beginning of March 2020. So why was there such a different impact of the disease in the various Italian regions? The approach proposed in our study, whose preprint is available on the scientific report repository, offers a possible explanation. Conventional risk assessment theory relies on the Christian risk triangle. In this framework, risk is evaluated as a function of three components, hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. For the purpose of this study, we can consider hazard as the degree of spread of the virus among the population of an Italian region, which is affected by a set of risk factors related to spatial and socioeconomic characteristics of the region. Exposure is the amount of people who might potentially be infected by the virus as a consequence of the hazard. Thus, it should coincide with the size of the population of that region. Vulnerability, the third component of the risk, is the attitude of an infected person to become sick or die. In general, it is strongly related to the age and initial health conditions before the infection. Among many possibilities, we selected the following variables as risk indicators, mobility index, housing concentration, healthcare density, air pollution, average winter temperature, and the percentage of over 60 individuals in the population. The motivation under the choice of these variables relies on either generic epidemic literature and on recently confirmed features of the COVID-19 outbreak. Values in the table are extracted region by region from historical data collected in previous years. Each indicator has been opportunely normalized between zero and one. Notice that the temperature scale has been also inverted. Preliminary check has been performed for estimating the correlation of each single risk indicator with the main impact parameters of the COVID-19 epidemic. These parameters are, on one hand, the total 
cases and total deaths accumulated in each region up to July 14, at the end of the first epidemic wave. On the other end, the intensive care occupancy recorded on April 2, close to the epidemic peak. The spatial distributions of the six risk indicators multiplied by the population of each region are here reported as chromatic maps and thus can be visually compared with the analogous maps of the three impact indicators. Some correlations seem quite good also at the first sight. Uh, more in detail, we found correlation coefficients ranging from 0.71 to 0.96, always higher than those observed as a function of the population, which can be considered the null model. However, the relative quadratic errors stay quite high from 0.26 to 0.62, this suggests that some proper combination of these risk indicators could be able to capture in a better way the global risk associated with each region. Such a goal has been realized through a multiplicative model for the evaluation of the risk index based on Christon triangle. After several tests, we found that the best choice is to consider hazard and vulnerability as a fine function of respectively mobility index, housing concentration, and healthcare density on one end, and air pollution, average winter temperature, and age of population on the other end. Exposure is represented by the population of each region. Following the scheme uh, shown in the figure, by multiplying exposure and vulnerability for a given region, we first recover the so-called consequences, which expresses the number of people in a given region who became ill for pathologies related to the virus. Then, by multiplying hazard and consequences, we will obtain the global risk index R, capital R, for each region. In this respect, uh, the risk index can be interpreted as the product of what is related to the causes of the virus diffusion in a given region and what is related to the effects on people. Finally, two versions of this model have been tested. Uh, an optimized one where the weights of the risk indicators are obtained through a less square fitting versus real COVID data, and an a priori one where all weights are assumed to be equal. At the end of the story, we definitely adopt the a priori version since it results to be more robust. This is the reason why we call R uh, the a priori risk index. Looking at the ranking of the Italian regions, compared with the COVID 19 data about total cases, deaths, and intensive care occupancy, updated both at April 2 and July 14. Notice again that the data for cases and deaths are accumulated, while those for intensive care are daily scores. The values of the risk index have been normalized to their maximum value, so that Lombardia has R equal 1. Due to the intrinsic limitations of the official COVID-19 data, due to the fact that asymptomatic infected individuals are difficult to detect, it is convenient to make the comparison at the aggregate level of groups of regions without expecting to predict the exact rank within each group. Therefore, we arranged the 20 regions in four risk groups, each one characterized by a different color and ordered according to the values of the risk index. With this choice, our model is clearly able to correctly identify the four northern regions where the epidemic effects in terms of cases, deaths, and intensive care occupancy have been far more evident. The first in the ranking, that is Lombardia, with the risk score about three times more than the second classified, and the group of the three regions immediately after it, Veneto, Piemonte, and Emilia-Romagna, even if not in the exact order of damage. A quite good agreement can be observed also for the other two groups, where only a few cases were overestimated or underestimated. Notice that the proposed risk classification seems quite robust, since it holds both near the peak of April and at the end of the first wave in July, when the intensive care occupancy of the majority of the regions was zero. The clear separation between northern regions from central and southern ones is also confirmed in this slide where the a priori risk color map is compared with the map of COVID-19 total cases in July on the left, and with the map of the serious cases and deaths of the seasonal flu in Italy on the right. The agreement is clearly visible already at the first sight, showing that our a priori model can be useful also for addressing other kinds of influences. In these plots on the left, we show the correlation between the a priori risk index and the three main impact indicators related to the outbreak. For each plot, a linear regression has been performed with person's correlation coefficients that always takes values greater or equal to 0.97, indicating a strong positive correlation. On the right of each plot, we report a corresponding percentage of damage observed in the three Italian macro regions, north, center, and south. 
also in this case, compared with the percentage of cumulated a priori risk associated to the sun macro regions, the correlation is evident. Here we show three sequences, the geographical distribution of the total cases, total number of deaths and current intensive care occupancy as the function of time, from March 9 to July 14. These sequences can be compared with the geographic map of the a priori risk level. In all the plots, uh, damages seem to spread over the regions with a variable intensity quite correctly predicted by our a priori risk analysis. Adoring another interesting way to visualize our results can be obtained by representing the a priori risk index through its two main aggregated components, hazard and consequences, and plotting each region as a point of coordinates H and C in what we call a risk diagram. The value of the risk index is reported in parentheses next to each region name. This red curve is the uh, ISO risk line corresponding to the average regional risk uh, R equal 0 0.15, which is able to correctly separate the four more damaged the regions and uh, highly risky, the are in the north uh, plus Lazio, uh, from all the other regions. Such a representation in terms of risk diagram may be used to build a policy model aimed at mitigate the damage in case of an epidemic outbreak like the COVID-19 one. In the final part of our study, we discuss some policy intervention proposals based on the a priori risk approach. We have seen that the risk index can be divided into components. Thus, if we interpret the consequences in terms of protection and the required support to people with the goal of improving the social results and reducing the economic cost, it is evident that enhancing the capability of the healthcare system appears to be the most important action since it is insufficient carrying capacity that creates the emergency. To address this issue, we propose a theoretical model based on two independent variables influencing the level of risk in a certain region, the infection ratio, yet the proportion of infected individuals over the total population and the number of per capita hospital beds as a measure of the impact of consequences caused by the spreading of the disease. We also provide some numerical example illustrating the subsequent steps that the policy maker facing an emergency outbreak should follow for the practical implementation of our model in a given region in order to minimize the risk level. In conclusion, our work is a first attempt to jointly consider different factors contributing to evaluate the a priori epidemic risk in a geographical area. Better medical knowledge and data availability will be important to further refine and improve the proposed methodology which could also be easily applied to other countries, provided that they make the necessary information accessible. Further studies will deal also with dynamic implications, thus providing more specific intuitions according to different evolutionary paths of contagion spreading. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Very nice talk indeed. Thank you. Um, is there any question from the audience? Uh, just open your microphone if you would like to ask a question otherwise write in the chat i'm just looking i don't see i don't see questions in the chat okay uh, i have you any ways of incorporating in your model any uh local heterogeneity at region level in terms of for instance mobility so the, or you are just considering the the bare population level as they no 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 we, we consider seven factors that uh, each of them are uh, of course uh, uh, calibrated on the, on each region, so our data a priori. This is the, the important thing is that are not data the current data, uh, so after the epidemics, but uh, because of course with the lockdown and so on, mobility uh, changes, but are uh, a priori data, so data collected in the previous years. So uh, our analysis could be our risk analysis could be done also before any kind of epidemics. So it's a sort of a focus. Of course, epidemics like COVID, or of course, uh, we, we, we compare it also with, uh, uh, with the flu, the seasonal flu, but because there are similar, of course, characteristics in terms, of course, of, uh, of uh, respiratory problems and so on. So not any kind of, of epidemic. But for this kind of epidemics, uh, our factors seem able to, uh, in, in some way, uh, capture uh, the different risk exposure of different regions, different parts of the countries, because this is very strange to explain why, uh, of course, also other other, other attempts, uh, other uh, other papers uh, 
try to put uh, um, in the explanation of course pollution and so on. Uh, but we think that uh, the aggregation of several factors, not the 21 factors probably <laughs> that the Italian government proposed, but uh, uh, maybe a few number of uh, more uh, more correlated factors could uh, could explain this uh, uh, difference between the regions. Not only in Italy, we are we are trying to to explain also the uh, anomalous diffusion also in other in other countries. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. And is there any other uh, question? I know that office, by the way, so it's very good. It's, it's a good pleasure to, it's like a pleasure to, to see it again because it's been a while since I was the last time there. Okay, great. If there is no other question, then let's thank Alessandro again. Thank you, Hans. And uh, let's go to the last talk of this session uh, by Jonathan Barlow. Uh, is Jonathan around? Uh, talk is modeling economic cascades due to a pandemic shock. And maybe if Jonathan is not around, maybe one of the co authors is around instead. Nope. Can you confirm that none of the authors of modeling economic cascades due to a pandemic shock is here? Let me just recheck the schedule again, but I think this is this was correct actually. Um, I can find him. Oh, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. I think I had some, uh, there was some last minute maybe shift because I see another talk in, uh, in the last slot, which is uh, W-shaped recovery after COVID-19 insights from an agent-based model. Uh, is that the author of this presentation? In, yeah, I'm in, here. Oh, sorry. I'm very sorry. I was no given uh, uh, incorrect information about the last talk. Sorry for that. Yeah, I got added at the last minute. I was supposed to present uh, earlier in the week and then they... Great. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> sorry for that. No, sorry. I mean, I wasn't notified. So, okay. Oh, that's okay. Uh, uh, Derav, right? Is that, is that correct? Great. Uh, no, uh, this is Dhruv. Oh, Dhruv. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you can share your screen and, uh, and uh, we can... Uh, yeah there you go are you going live or you recorded it uh no i think i'll present it okay uh, great. live yeah i have i don't have a recording okay cool is, is, a, is it visible yes it is very good and this Indeed. and this too i made it yeah okay gone thank you all right great uh so good evening everyone uh thank you so much for inviting me for for this conference uh yeah so this is work that um uh, uh, we've done on trying to sort of trying to understand the economic consequences of the pandemic itself. And so what I'm going to talk about is the kind of recovery that we can, uh, that we can, uh, the kind of recovery scenarios that are possible. Uh, and this is done using an agent based model. So this is work that is done at the ENS in Paris in collaboration with uh, Jean-Philippe Bouchot, Stanislaw Gualdi, uh, Marco Tarsi and Francesco Zamponi. Right. So, so let's go. Um, yeah, so the economic impact of COVID has been quite uh, quite stark and quite dire. So for just just as a matter of example, we can look at the levels of unemployment that we've seen uh, in the U.S. For instance, we've had we had weeks uh, in 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 March and in April where you had about seven to eight million people being laid off uh, every week, and consequently, you've also had a record level of uh, bankruptcies as well. So these are numbers that we haven't seen for a, for a very very long time. So the question that is on everyone's, everyone's mind is that what is going to happen next? So overall, if you, if you, look, at, if you look at the discussions around, this, around, these, around the issue about what can happen next, you can sort of summarize into four scenarios. Right? So the first one is the V-shaped recovery, which is to say that you know, there is going to be this shortfall um, in, in output, uh, but then, the, but then as, soon as, the, as soon as the shock is gone, um, the, the economy is going to come right back up, uh, and this is a very this is a very optimistic scenario, right? Uh, the, the slightly more pessimistic scenario is the U-shaped recovery, which says that uh, you know there is going to be there is going to be a shortfall indeed because of the lockdowns uh, due to um, due to the pandemic, but the recovery will be will be will be slower than 
uh, than, than, a, than a V-shaped scenario would suggest. So this will take about one to two years to actually come back to pre-COVID levels. The most dire situation is the L-shaped scenario, which is to say that there is going to be a shortfall, but we're going to lose productive capacity, uh, and then we're going to stay in this, in this depressed state for, for, for a far longer period of time. So we're looking at five, six, or even longer of say about seven years in this uh, in this depressed state, and finally there is this interesting uh, uh, situation that has also been imagined, which is a W-shaped scenario. Now you can have two ways in which they can, this can occur. You can have a situation wherein uh, there is a first uh, shock, which is the first uh, wave of lock, first wave of lockdowns, and this will cause a shortfall in output, but then governments all over the world will lift restrictions and then the economy will try to sort of recover back. But then there would be a second wave of infections. This is something that is happening um, in France, for instance, where I am right now. And then the economy will suffer a second um, recession. Now, this is what I would like to call the exogenous W-shaped scenario. You can also have an endogenous W-shaped scenario wherein uh, you, can have a, you can have a first recession, but the second recession can happen because of the internal dynamics of the economy without actually having, uh, without actually having the second wave of infection present. Right? So how we, what is our approach towards modeling this? So we want to understand these scenarios using a microeconomic agent-based model. And this is the, and this is the Mark Zero model that, uh, that, had, that has been presented earlier uh, in, in many papers. But what we're really interested in now is to, is to, is to understand these scenarios along two axes. The first axis um, is the amplitude of the shock, which is to say how much of uh, consumer uh, behavior has changed, how much uh, firm productivity has fallen, and then also how long the shock lasts. So for instance, you can be modulate between three months to nine months as, as the duration of the shock. And of course, the recovery also depends on the kind of economic policy mix that you, that you use. Now, we want, to, we want to focus on the economic consequences of the pandemic and not really on the dynamics of the pandemic, which is to say, which is to say that we are not really looking at uh, at, at calibrating our model or conditioning our model to the number of cases uh, of COVID-19, but we take, we take the restrictions that the healthcare authorities are taking as a given. And we assume that the healthcare authorities have suggested that we, have to, uh, we, have, we need to have lockdowns. And conditioned on this, we are looking at what the, what the long-term consequences of the pandemic are going to be. Right. And of course, there is a related aspect about time scales because, you can, as you can imagine, the pandemic is fast. However, the eco however, you know, the macro economy is a sluggish creature, so the economy is going to take far longer to to recover. So, rather than talking about short-term optimal lockdown policies, we want to really look at what the long-term evolution of the economy is going to be. Right. So, the model itself has four agents. Uh, so, you have households, you have firms. You have the banking sector and you have a central bank. Right? So the household receives wages from firms and it consumes a part of these uh, part of these wages. And the proportion of the proportion of these wages that are consumed is determined by this parameter called the consumption propensity, small c. Right. And this is going to be a key parameter in what follows, because this will determine the, the change in behavior of households uh, with respect to their consumption habits. Now, whatever uh, is, is not consumed uh, is saved uh, and then households are an interest on this. Uh, and finally, you can also have uh, you can also have firms. Uh, giving dividends uh, uh, sharing and as, as a profit sharing mechanism. So this acts as a supplementary source of revenue for households. Firms themselves uh, produce goods to satisfy household demand. And, it, and the production uh, that happens in, of, by firms happens via a linear production function uh, and which is modulated by firm productivity zeta. And this is again another parameter that will be crucial in what follows. So firms can hire and fire workers uh, based on the level of uh, based on the level of demand in the economy, and they also can set wages based on level of unemployment. Now, crucial variable for uh, for firms is is firm fragility phi, which is simply the level of debt or the negative cash balance uh, upon the uh, as, as it's the ratio of the debt to the to the to the wage cost, right? And if the firm is too fragile, then it goes bankrupt, and the bankruptcy threshold is set is set economy wide. And this is called, and in what follows, this will be denoted as theta. 
right? And the banking sector finally is is made up of uh, is 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 made up of a representative bank which sets rates on deposits and loans, and there's a central bank which sets an economy-wide bank rate, and it also has an inflation targeting mandate. Now, so this model uh, has been studied uh, before. Uh, and it has a very interesting phase diagram as a function of theta, the bankruptcy threshold, and R, which is the firing to, uh, which is the which is the ratio to of the hiring rate to the firing rate. Right? Then you have these four phases, and what is going to interest us mostly, because that's where we begin, that's where we initialize the economy, is the full employment phase. So the full employment phase is where the level of unemployment is pretty low, uh, and you have and you have uh, moderately high inflation, right? So how do we model the COVID shock itself? Uh, as you can imagine, the lockdowns uh, that that we have had all over the world cause a fall in demand, and they also cause a fall cause a fall in production. So we model this as a reduction in the consumption propensity, as a change in habits of households to consume. So uh, and this is uh, this is a reduction in the parameter C, and for the production itself, we we model this as a reduction in firm productivity. So the reduction in the variable theta, and we change the duration of the shock as well. Right, uh, and for and for modeling purposes, we set we set each time step to be one month, and as I mentioned before, we we set the economy in a rather prosperous state where you have low levels of unemployment, but you have say about 1.3 percent of inflation computed annually, and we will neglect monetary policy channels. So the traditional monetary monetary policy uh, framework by changing interest rates is is going to be neglected in what follows. Right. So, what are these? So, I talked about four scenarios, and this model is able to is able to generate these four scenarios, right? And we don't have to build a model. Uh, generally, what happens is that we build the model because we have a particular scenario in mind. But here, by just modulating the amplitude of the of the shock, we're able to generate all these four scenarios. So, within a coherent framework, we're able to sort of understand all that is quite all that is possible. Within within the model. Now, of course, the worst case situation is the L-shaped scenario, and we want we want to understand under what conditions this happens, so that we can we can suggest policies to prevent this scenario from occurring. And, and the way we do this is via phase diagrams. And the phase diagrams that we that we that we that we construct are in are in the are in the space of uh, the fall in productivity, so delta zeta. And the and the reduction in consumption propensity delta C. So what we note is that if the shock does not last for too long, so about three months, then you really need a strong shock for for to to make the economy uh, uh, go into an L-shaped uh, situation. So this is the uh, so this is the leftmost um, graphic uh, in the top in the top row. However, the moment you change. Uh, the, the duration of the shock. So if, you, if the shock is longer, then even a small shock can 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 tip the economy uh, into into this depressed state. And this can happen for for shortfalls in consumption for as low as 30%. And 30% is a is a crucial number because this is the number that we that we that we now have that we now have. For instance, empirically, we can now see that the that consumption levels have fallen by about this number in say England or even in France. Right? A related point is also that the, that the higher levels of unemployment are actually seen after the shock, right? So the levels of unemployment we see within uh, and during the shock are not representative of what is going to happen later. So we might imagine that, you know, that the worst is behind us, you know, as we come out of the shock. But in fact, no, there is the, uh, the worst is actually uh, yet to come. Right? So we want to prevent this ha from happening, of course, and the and we suggest four uh, situations. So the first situation is the baseline worst case scenario, wherein you're not really doing anything. There's no policy. There's no intervention, uh, right? And we want to compare this as sort of our benchmark. Then we have a naive policy, which is which is that we increase the bankruptcy threshold uh, during the shock, right? So this means that firms can in, can can get more debt, but only during the duration of the shock. And as and the moment the shock is removed or the shock is gone, uh, the bankruptcy threshold uh, is set back up to its original value. And of course, it's naive because you can imagine that this is not going to be useful because firms will probably need more support later. Now, so the third scenario is that is is to not is to supplement household savings as well. And then this is done by a, by this much debated helicopter drop. Which is essentially injecting cash directly to households. Right? We just give, uh, we just increase uh, savings of the households. And finally, there's an adaptive policy, which is which actually looks at the bankruptcy threshold, 
and and doesn't and it modifies it in a very smooth way, which is to say that we're not going to remove the uh, remove this this help that we have provided to uh, to firms right away, but we're going to reduce the help, uh, reduce this uh, reduce uh, this bankruptcy threshold um, only very gradually, in such a way that only the most indebted firms actually go bankrupt, right? So only about the in this in the example only the 25% most indebted firms actually go, go bankrupt under this policy, right? So let's see what actually ha ends up happening. So the first column is the column where there is no policy, right? And so this is, the, you see that there is a permanent loss of output and bankruptcy is very high. And this is a permanently, you know, it's like a deflationary scenario because wages are falling and prices are falling. So this is sort of like, it's like really, this is the, the most dire situation you can imagine. Now, with the naive policy, as I suggested, um, you know what we've just done is to just push the the point of the point of cri crisis a certain amount into the future. Because even though during the shock firms don't go bankrupt, as soon as we remove the remove uh, the policy, firms are more indebted and uh, they're more fragile, and therefore they have to uh, and and they and they deliver and, and I mean. They they go bankrupt um, uh, as soon as we lift the the policy as, as soon as we remove the policy. Now, of course, by adding the supplementary support to households this time around, you can sort of you can reduce the effect of the you can reduce the effect of the naive policy because now households have enough savings accumulated that they can that, that this can be injected back into the economy and into the private sector to sort of uh, restart the economy, so to speak. However, there is an interesting thing that happens, which is, which is that there is a second recession that occurs some ways down the line. Uh, and this has got nothing to do with the fact that there is, uh, that there is a second infection, the second, re second wave of lockdowns, but it's just the internal dynamics of the economy that creates it. Right? So this is the endogenous W-shaped scenario. And finally, the adaptive policy is something that really prevents uh, any kind of bankruptcy because we are really helping the helping firms along uh, um, uh, as they uh, as they recover from the shock. And as you can see, the, the adaptive policy in the dotted vertical line here ends far later. It's about 90 months after the shock has actually happened. So we have to provide support to the to firms for far longer. Than, uh, than we initially thought. And of course, the, the flip side of this is that there is higher inflation, right? About 3% uh, as, we, as, we as we have this policy in place. So what do we learn from all of this? What we learn is that small shocks can cause lasting damage, right? A shock, a shortfall in about 30%, but lasting for a very long amount of long period of time can cause, a, can cause permanent damage. And what we need to do is to, is to prevent this kind of thing to happen. So this is the famous Draghi uh, statement that we will do whatever it takes. And, we, and this is even more important now because there are already fears that you will have a permanent loss of productive capacity. And this is sort of, this is the so-called 90% economy scenario, wherein we are going to lose 10% of capacity and 10% of firms are never going to come back, right? Uh, and in our, in, in our uh, framework, the successful policy is actually to higher inflation. And we can, of course, argue whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. And I would say that this is probably a good thing given, given the levels of inflation we have in the Eurozone, for instance. But this happens because you're directly stimulating demand by boosting savings uh, of households or by directly lending to firms over a very long period of time. And finally, the focus is on long-term economic recovery rather than talking about short-term trade-offs between the health of the economy versus the health of the citizenry. Uh, and I think what is the, a crucial uh, element of our work is that we can, we can recover all of, these, all of these scenarios within a single framework and we, don't, uh, and, and we, can, and we can actually see, play around with the policies that are that are available to actually have a better idea of of what is the kind of policies that 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 will uh, that will help us and how long these policies have to be in place. So yeah, that's all I had to say. And um, thanks a lot. Very good. Thanks a lot for your nice talk. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Yeah. Uh, let me see. I can't see anything in the chat. Uh, can I do a question? Please go. On. Uh, so you talk about uh, the different scenarios that you can observe. So the the you know the D shape, the L shape, U shape, and 
W shape. But I've also recently, um, you know, seen in, in the news that we're also talking about a different uh, scenario, which was, uh, uh, you know, maybe some economists thought about, which is the K scenario, where basically you have, uh, you know, people that are actually, you know, wealthier, they are usually uh, the one that are less um, um, impact, they had less impact, uh, you know, during the pandemic, because they, ha they could have the possibility to work from, uh, from home, but at the same time, people instead uh, from not wealthy people, let's say, will maybe have a problem uh, in the long term scenario. So, can you have, uh, can, do you have any thought about this? Uh, um, that's it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a that's a very important point. In fact, and uh, this is in fact the 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 one of two things that that is still missing in the in the model that we have right now. So, the K-shaped scenario actually points to something. Uh, something very fundamental that we have in our economies, which is inequality. Now, inequality could be in terms of the distribution of wealth, or inequality in just in terms of uh, terms of distribution of of say health from the state itself, right? So, and right now, what we do not have is that we do not have sufficient level of heterogeneity in the model to be able to actually have this kind of uh, this kind of k-shaped recovery wherein one set of uh, one set of economic actors will have this will recover faster whereas the other set will will recover slowly so in fact so you're absolutely right this is an important thing but then we'll have to modify the model and add more heterogeneity in the model to be able to generate this this scenario yeah yeah uh, thanks very much thank you thank you any other question from the field that if if not, then let's thank our speaker again. Thank you much thank for your you. talk. And I think this comes uh, here comes the conclusion of this interesting uh, um, session. Uh, I don't think there is anything more planned for today. So I hope you will enjoy uh, the last day of the conference tomorrow. And I'm pretty sure we'll see you around uh, somewhere in some other session tomorrow. Thank you very much. See you Great. soon. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.